uh, for. Our question today, and in my title today, is how good do you have to be to go to heaven? How good do you have to be to go to heaven? Now, next week, we're going to continue just a short two-part series. Next week, we're going to talk about how bad do you have to be to go to hell? Now, you can't get any straightforward in the gospel than heaven and hell. And so this morning, we're going to look at how good do you have to be to go to heaven. Now, there are three general common beliefs that people have today about heaven. Many people, even most religions, believe in some version of heaven. I mean, most religions and most people believe in the idea of heaven. Um, Even if we disagree, even if religions and people disagree on what heaven is like, most people believe in the idea of heaven, and we've seen movies and books and paintings and things, etc., that have tried to depict and describe heaven for us and give us images of heaven. In Revelation 21, if you want to look in the, in the scripture, Revelation 21 gives us a snapshot of what heaven is like. It tells us that the walls are made of precious stones, crystal and jasper and emerald, just to mention a few. It tells us that the gates are made of pearls. And it says that the streets are of pure gold. It tells us that in heaven there'll be no tears, there'll be no sorrow, there'll be no pain, there'll be no death. And of course, in heaven there'll be the beauty and the glory of God, and there'll be Jesus himself, the Savior and the King. So even Revelation 21, that snapshot, it just scratches the surface of what the greatness and the grandeur of heaven will believe. But most people believe in some version of heaven. Second, most people, and many people I know, maybe you've heard this too, many people believe that all roads lead to heaven. Anybody ever heard that? I've had people tell me, they basically are saying, listen, if there really is a heaven, and since most religions are basically the same, any road will get you to heaven. Interesting. And you know what? Christianity has been criticized over the years for being so dogmatic and narrow-minded, saying Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, wide is the road that leads to destruction. Many go there. They'll take any road. But narrow is the road that leads to eternal life, and few find it. Most people or many people believe in some version of heaven. Many and most people believe that all roads lead to heaven. And then the third common belief that people have about heaven is that everybody goes to heaven, basically. I mean, after all, God's a good God, he's a softy at heart, and if you're a decent person, everybody will go to heaven, except, you know, those really, really, really bad people. Not us, but those really, really, really bad people. But everybody basically goes to heaven. You know, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, God is not slack concerning his promises, He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. God wants none to go to hell. He wants everyone to go to heaven. But he wants all to come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, the truth is God wants everybody to go to heaven, but the truth is not everybody will go to heaven. There was many years ago, I had an interesting conversation with a man in the community one day. And he said to me, he said, you know, all my life, I've tried to be a good person. All my life, I've tried to do the right things. He said, but I've always wondered, how much is good enough? Is it 10 good deeds will get me to heaven? A hundred good deeds? A thousand Good deeds will get me to heaven? Or does God just kind of keep score up there and just as long as I have one more good thing than bad thing, then I'll get into heaven? And then he looked at me and he said, so preacher, you tell me, how good do you have to be to go to heaven? What a great question. Maybe you've wondered that question. And I'm going to give you the answer that I gave that man that day. I'm going to give that to you today. And I think you're going to be surprised. He was. Let's look at that. 
Psalm 15, let's start there. Verses 1 and 2, just two verses from Psalm 15. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? Now, when it's talking about the holy hill and being in the presence of a holy God, it's talking about today and present day, and it's also talking about heaven, the presence of God. How many know a holy place where a holy God lives? Who shall abide there? Who shall dwell there? It says, they that live uprightly and do righteousness. Say righteousness. Righteousness. Psalm 24, flip over there, verses 3 to 5. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in the holy place? So who can abide? Who can ascend? Who can stand in the presence of a holy God in a holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up their soul to vanity or sworn deceitfully, they shall receive the blessing of the Lord, which is righteousness, say righteousness, from the God of his salvation. Again, the question, how good do you have to be to go to heaven? The simple and short answer I gave that man that day was this. You have to be perfect. Let me say that again. You have to be perfect. Now listen, before you tune me out, hear me out. What does the Bible say? Who can abide? Who can stand? Who can ascend? Who can stand and dwell and live in the presence of a holy God in a holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have received righteousness, which comes from God through salvation through Jesus Christ. Here's today's big idea. Let me sum up what I mean and help explain what I mean by you have to be perfect. To be good enough to go to heaven, we have to be perfect, that is, or righteous good. Not pretty good. (laughs) Not do the best you can good. Righteous good. That's how good. How good? Righteous good. You have to have a righteousness. What does the Bible say? You have to have a righteousness that comes from God that's through salvation in God. A righteousness that's from God. Not self-righteousness, not social morality, a righteousness that comes from God. Not righteous good in my eyes. I have a lot of people say to me, well, that may be right for you, but that's not right for me. How many know righteousness is not your version or my version? That's not the righteousness. That's not the kind of righteousness we're talking about. You see, It's not self-righteousness, what I think is right or what you think is right or what's right for me. It's not, righteous good is not only not self-righteousness, it's not only the opinion of others. Well, society says this is right and says this is wrong. Society calls this right, calls it moral, calls it good. Listen, The righteousness that gets us into heaven is not self-righteousness. And it's not the righteousness of others. It's only the righteousness of God. What's right in God's eyes? Not my eyes, your eyes, not the church's eyes, not in, come on, anyone else's eyes. What is right in God's eyes? That's righteous good. That's the only kind of good that will get us into heaven. Now, when I told this man that day that you have to be perfect. You have to be righteous good. You have to have a righteousness that's not self-righteousness or the righteousness of other people, but only the righteousness of God will get us into heaven. He looked at me and he said this, oh boy, I've got a problem. And you know what I said to him? Oh no, sir. We all have a problem. Not just you. If that's the standard, I've got a problem. 
And this morning, we all have a problem. If it's going to take the righteousness of God that comes through salvation in Jesus Christ, if it's going to take that to get us to heaven, without that, we're all in trouble. And we've all got a problem. God's not going to ask us when we stand before him what church we went to, what religion we belong to. If we did ten righteous things, a hundred righteous things, a thousand good things, or if we had one more good one, the scoreboard says we had one more. He's going to say, do you have the righteousness and do you stand in the righteousness of God? Because in heaven, it's only righteous and holy if you're going to stand before a holy God in a holy place. You see, we've all got a problem if that's the standard. Romans chapter 3, it's interesting because in chapter 1 and chapter 2, Paul says, you know, there's talking about the unrighteousness of pagans and unbelievers, and then he even talks about the Jews and the Gentiles, about their version and their laws and their rules. And this is what Paul says in Romans 3 in verse 9 to 12, he says, so what should we conclude looking at all the unrighteousness and all the rules and laws? He said, what shall we conclude? Are we any better? Are we more righteous? Are we any better than anyone else? And he says, no. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. So if anybody tells you they're good enough, well, I'm a good person, I think I'm a good person, and I'm just as good as the next guy. How many know being a decent person, a good person, and being as good as the next guy is not going to get good enough to get to heaven? You have to be righteous good. You have to have a righteousness that comes from God. Not what's right in my eyes or your eyes, not what's right in the world's eyes, only what's right in God's eyes. Because any other, quote, goodness... There is none righteous enough. No, not one. Two key points. First of all, guilt is the reason we need righteousness. Guilt or being guilty is the reason we need righteousness. Because none of us are perfect, because none of us are righteous enough, how many know we're guilty before a holy God? And that's why we need righteousness. I hear people say, well, I don't need salvation. I don't need to be rescued. I don't need a God to save. If you're not good enough, in the sense you're not righteous enough, you're guilty. Say, but I didn't do any horrible... You see... Mankind is guilty before a holy God. If you go back to Genesis, go back to the creation story, six times after each day, God created different parts of the creation. And at the end of the day, you know what God did? He stood back and he looked at what he made that day and he said, it is good. You know what the word good there is? The, is the Hebrew word sidkenu. T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U, which there's no test, so you don't have to remember that. But the Hebrew word good there means righteous. As it should be, pure, perfect. How many know when God made man and he made creation, he didn't make imperfection? It was perfect. When God looked at everything he made, he said, it's good, it's righteous, it's perfect. It's just as I intended it to be. Matter of fact, when he made man on the seventh day, what did God say? It is very good. Very righteous. The best I ever did. Do you realize when God made mankind, he says, that's the best thing I ever created. They're righteous. They're perfect. Mm. They're just the way I intended them to be. And then in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned. 
right? And that which was righteous and that which was perfect and that which was very good or very righteous or as it should be became marred and stained and imperfect. Man was no longer righteous anymore. Mankind no longer had the righteousness of God, the image of God that God created them in His image, in His likeness, perfect and righteous. No longer did they bear the image of God. They were unrighteous. And they were guilty before mankind. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Through one man, Adam, and you can throw Eve in there, for those who think I'm being hard on Adam, through one man, Adam, sin entered the world. And through that sin, death and guilt was passed on to all mankind. From that moment on, from the moment Adam sinned, man who was created righteous and perfect became unrighteous and imperfect in the eyes of God. All of us. So before we blame and beat up Adam... Say, boy, if it wasn't for Adam, how many know all of us? What does Romans 3.23 say? All have sinned. Say all. all. Say all means everyone. All. And everyone includes me. <laughs> so before we throw it all on Adam and say it's Adam's fault, and it's because Adam sinned, but since Adam, Sin came into the world. And when sin came into the world, guilt of sin and the punishment of death of sin was now on mankind. Romans 6.23 says that for the wages of sin or the payment or the punishment for sin is spiritual death. Anyone who is imperfect, unrighteous, before God, before a holy God, is guilty. And guilt is the reason we need righteousness. And not only is man guilty, all mankind is guilty, but the Bible says that the death penalty hang and hung over mankind. Do you realize if Jesus didn't come and die and pay the debt, we all deserve the death penalty. We all deserve spiritual death. We all deserve not to go to heaven. Because there'll be no imperfection in heaven. And man which was made perfect was now imperfect because of sin. And man was guilty. And anyone who has not accepted what Jesus Christ did and the payment he made on Calvary still stands guilty. And the death penalty still hangs over their life. But I'm a good person. Wonderful. Keep being a good person. All roads lead to <laughs> Only those who have the righteousness of God. What's interesting is about Romans 6.23 is it does say that the wages of sin is death. We all are guilty before God. We all deserve the death penalty. But the verse doesn't end there. You know there's a second part of the verse? It says, but. How I many know that's a... I'm not going to say it. It's a big but. <laughs> but when you talk about heaven and hell, you got to say something funny every once in a while. Because it's kind of serious in here. And it's serious, folks. This is serious stuff. I'm not playing religion with this. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm not trying to manipulate. Listen, the truth is, is we need to be righteous. We need to be perfect. We have to have a righteousness in the sight of God. Otherwise, we're guilty. And the penalty for that guilt is spiritual death. But the gift of God. But the gift of God. You can't earn it. Can't buy it. Listen, you can't be good enough for it. How many know a gift you don't earn? A gift is not good enough. You can't be good. It's a gift. That's what makes it special. It's a gift. The gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ. In other words, even though mankind sinned and because of Adam and sin entered the world and all of us come under the umbrella of the guilt of sin and hang over us the death penalty of sin, but God sent His Son to die on a cross and when He died on the cross, He gave His life and He gave us a gift by which we can be righteous again, by which we can know and bear the image of God again and He made it so we could be righteous again and the Bible says that gift is eternal life. Listen, God had a plan. We've got a problem, but God had a plan. How many know mankind was shocked that they sinned, but God wasn't? Now, he didn't make them sin. He gave them a free will they could choose. To stay perfect in a perfect environment. Choose right, but they chose to sin. And because of that, all of us come under that umbrella. But aren't you glad, since all of us have a problem, that God had a plan? What is that plan? Second point. While guilt is the reason we need righteousness, secondly, grace is the remedy to receive righteousness. How good do you have to be to go to heaven? You have to be righteous good. You have to have the righteousness that comes from God. How do you have the righteousness that comes from God? Since we can't do it ourselves and we don't have the ability to to make ourselves righteous, it's a gift. And it comes by grace, through faith. You see, since the garden, how many know mankind has not been righteous or right? And throughout time, man has tried, and how many know people are still trying today to be righteous again and be good enough for God? I meet people all the time, they're trying to be good enough. And listen, we should be good. We should do what's right. But listen, doing what's right should not come out of guilt or out of motivation of I have to do this for my religion or for myself or for other people. It needs to come out of a righteousness that God gives us. And when God gives us that righteousness, that righteousness is what propels us and gives us the power to do right and to stay right. You see, the moment we accept Christ's gift of grace on Calvary, God gives us and declares us righteous. And then he says, now that I've declared you righteous, now go out and be righteous. It's similar to a person who graduates from, let's say, medical school. They get a diploma that says you are now a medical person. You're now a doctor. How many know they haven't practiced anything yet? They've just been declared that. Now it says, now go out and practice what you've been declared. And it's the same way when we accept Christ and his gift of righteousness through grace, by faith through grace. When we accept that, God declares us righteous again in the sight of God. And then he says, now I expect you to go out and do righteous. But the righteousness is motivated through his righteousness and his power, not our own power and our own strength. Grace is what enables us to become righteous and to stay righteous so that we can be good enough, righteous enough for heaven. You know, when man has tried so many ways, I mean, no, we've done it all we've how many of you have ever turned over a new leaf? Don't raise your hand. How many over said, I'm never going to do that again? Don't, don't raise your hand. We've, we've tried to stack up. I know people who's trying to stack up the deeds. And listen, stack them all up. But that pile is going to be thrown at his feet. How many know every kind of religion over the years, man has erected, and embraced all types of man-made religious ways. Now, religion's not bad in itself, but it's man-made. And man can't make it himself righteous. And all the religions in the world, and all of following the rules of, of, of a religion is not going to make us righteous enough. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 64, 6 says this, Our righteousness is as filthy rags. 
In other words, all of man's efforts down through the years to erect and embrace religions or turn over new leaves and to try new things, all of man's efforts and attempts to make himself righteous again, or even our own attempts to make ourselves righteous again, are filthy rags. Let me illustrate it this way. Have you ever had to clean a window? Mark, I know you guys cleaned our windows just this week, and I watched these guys do it. How, how, many, know, how many know when you clean a window, if there's dirt and, and, and stuff on it, you don't take a dirty rag and try to clean away the dirt. You know what you do? You smear the dirt around. That's all you do. You need a clean rag to take away the dirt. Our righteousness, our religious efforts, our rules, and our, our attempts to be good enough or to stack up enough things, our attempts to turn over new leaves, our attempts in our own power to make ourselves righteous enough and good enough for God in heaven is like a filthy rag, like cleaning a window with a filthy rag. All we're doing is smearing the dirt around. We're not getting clean or pure or righteous again. Jeremiah 23, 6 says this. This was God's plan. We have a problem. We were created righteous, but unrighteousness came into the world and we lost the image of God. So mankind was guilty and needed righteousness. Man tried to be righteous on their own, have tried all different ways and erected different religions and ways to be righteous, but none of them, they're all filthy rags. But God had a plan. In Jeremiah 23, 6, here's a prophecy of Jesus Christ, the righteous one. It says, God said, I will raise up a righteous branch. <laughs> Speaking of Jesus, he will bring righteousness again to mankind. And his name will be called Jehovah Sidkenu. What was the word, the Hebrew word in Genesis when God created man and he said it was good, it was very good? It was the word Sidkenu. It was the word righteous. And so what God said is that mankind sinned and came into the world. And so God had to raise up a righteous branch and he sent Jesus Christ to come to earth and he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross. And when he died on the cross, he would become Jehovah or the Lord our righteousness not our own righteousness but his righteousness he is jehovah sidkenu the lord our righteousness the truth is we can't be righteous on our own but we can be righteous through jesus christ it's a gift of grace by faith in romans 3 23 to 20 24 to 23 26 it says for we are all justified freely by his grace. How are we justified? Justified is a legal term that means just as if we never sinned. How do we become just as if we never sinned, even though sin hangs over us? How do we become justified? He says by his grace. Through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God gave Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood that is received by faith. He did this to show his righteousness for the sins past or before Calvary that went unpunished. He did it also to give us righteousness at this present time for all those who would put their faith in Jesus Christ. Do you realize when Jesus Christ died, he then made it possible for us to receive his righteousness? He made a provision for righteousness for the sins past, for those before Calvary, and he made provision for those after Calvary who would put their faith in him. There is righteousness, the Bible says, for this present time through faith and grace in Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad, even though we had a problem, God had a plan? And the plan was to send the righteous one to be our righteousness. Romans 5, 6 through 17 says, You see... Just at the right time, we were still powerless, guilty in our own sin, but Christ died for the unrighteous. God demonstrated his own love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified, or just as if we've never sinned by his blood, how much more are we saved from God's wrath or the death penalty that hung over us? 
For if through one man Adam sin entered the world, through one man Jesus Christ came God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness. Aren't you glad? Even though through one man Adam sin entered the world and the death penalty and guilt for sin, but through one man, the God-man, the righteous one, the righteous branch, Jesus Christ, Jehovah Sidkenu, through him we can be righteous at this present time. Because He came. And we can receive God's abundant gift of grace. And God's gift of righteousness. See, righteousness is a gift that comes by grace through one person. Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21 says this. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's righteous again old things are passed away all things have become new or righteous again for he who knew no sin became sin or put his sin on himself that we might be made the righteousness of God we have to be made righteous and we're only made righteous through Jesus Christ. A pastor, a religion, a person, humanity can't make us righteous. Only Jesus' righteousness is good enough for God and for heaven. Philippians 3 9. Paul said, I want to be found not in my own righteousness. And he listed all this stuff. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrew. I follow the laws. I did this. I did that. Look at all the good things. He said, All of that is nothing. He says, I want to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness that comes by the law or works of religion, but a righteousness that's of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Here's the bottom line as we wrap this up this morning. The only way to be good enough to go to heaven is we have to receive the righteousness of God that comes only through salvation in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. No other way. Say, Pastor, that's narrow. That's dogmatic. That's narrow-minded. That's that's too that's what Jesus said. Wide is the road, and all the other roads will lead you down to destruction, but there's a narrow road that leads to eternal life. There's only one road, there's only one path, and it comes by receiving his righteousness by faith through grace and his salvation. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus 16, gives us a picture. Remember before Calvary, I mean, they had to do sacrifices. And there's a picture in Leviticus 16 of the high priest going into the holies of holies once a year on the Day of Atonement to do a sin offering for people, for all mankind, for mankind at the time. And the Bible tells us in Leviticus 16 that there were two goats. One was a sacrifice goat that would be offered on the altar. And there was a scapegoat. How many of you have ever heard the term scapegoat? Well, it comes from this image. What would happen is the high priest would take the goat that was to be sacrificed, put him on the altar, and then take the blood off of that sacrifice goat and put it on the scapegoat. And there was a transfer that took place. The guilt of the scapegoat went on to the sacrifice goat. And the innocence and the righteousness of the sacrifice goat would be put on the scapegoat and the scapegoat was let go free and was freed and was on its own to go and to live. That picture is a picture of what 1 Peter chapter 2, 22 to 24 tells us in the New Testament. Christ did no sin, neither was there guile in his mouth. When he was reviled, they reviled not. When he suffered, he threatened not. He committed himself on the cross to the God who is a righteous judge who himself, speaking of Jesus, 
bore our sins in his body on a tree on Calvary, that we being dead to sin might live to righteousness by his stripes. We are healed. The moment Jesus died on the cross, there was a transfer. The guilt of mankind was now transferred onto Jesus. Oh, come on. And the innocence and the righteousness of Jesus was transferred to us, the scapegoats, who can go free and be saved. Here's what I want you to do in closing. Imagine with me a courtroom. How many have ever seen a courtroom movie or a scene? I want you to imagine this pulpit is the bench in the courtroom. The judge is standing behind the bench. How many know the only righteous one and the righteous branch or the righteous judge, the Bible says, is Jesus himself. He's the only righteous one. There's none others that are righteous. Jesus is the judge, the righteous one behind the bench. All of mankind, everybody sitting in front of me and those that are online today, all of us representing mankind are on trial, standing before the judge. The clerk reads the charges. (laughs) I'm not going to start naming things. I didn't peek in your window. But how many know the clerk starts naming your sins and my sins and the sins of mankind throughout the ages? And when all of the charges come before the righteous judge, he takes his gavel and he says, guilty. There's no one righteous. There's no one worthy. They all deserve the death penalty. And then, in a moment, the judge closes the book on the sins, steps out from behind the bench, steps down the corridors of heaven, steps up Calvary's hill and hangs on a cross and says, I'll pay it. I'm righteous enough. I'll pay the debt. They're not worthy, but I'm worthy. And he hung on Calvary's cross for you and for me who were guilty and deserved death but instead there can be a transfer that takes place. A transfer from death to eternal life. A transfer from our guilt onto him and his righteousness onto us so we can be good enough. So we can be righteous enough. So we can stand and we can ascend and dwell and abide in a holy hill with a holy God because Jesus is the Lord, our righteousness. Bow your head with me, close your eyes.